Our next speaker that will be uh, talking to us this afternoon is uh, Jess Whitlock. Uh, Jess calls uh, Duncan, Oklahoma home, I guess. Uh, has been preaching for 40 years. Hard to believe that. He's such a young-looking man. <laughs> he has served congregations in Oklahoma and Texas. Uh, he attended OCC and the old Preston Road School of Preaching. He began preaching in 1970, uh, attended part-time at the Elk City School of Preaching, uh, and l later served as an instructor at the West Side School of Preaching. He's done radio work. He's done debating. He's uh, worked on the staff at Christian camps for 33 years. He's held meetings in uh, seven states, and he and his wife, Terry, have begun their third year of work in the uh, Dolores Church in the Avant, Texas. And he will be holding a gospel, uh, gospel meeting beginning tomorrow in uh, Fish Hatchery Road, Church of Christ. So I certainly would encourage you, if you have the ability, to go and attend that. There is a bulletin, uh, or, uh, on the, a flyer on the bulletin board in the back that you can uh, look at the uh, dates and topics there. When I first saw Jesse's uh, topic there, the book he's reviewing called uh, uh, Discovering Our Roots, I thought there'd be a lot of men excited here because I'm sure he's a, this was a hair restoration book, but not so. <laughs> Probably get more good out of that uh, book like that than you would the book he's about to review. <laughs> but anyway, uh, Brother Jesse, come and talk to us. As you can see, it's not a hair restoration book. I appreciate so much the invitation from the elders of this great congregation and Brother David Brown for allowing me to come and to speak on one of these books. You know, as we think about this congregation and the many, many good works that are done, by the elders here, we need to ever keep them in our prayers because it's no secret faithful congregations are becoming fewer and fewer with each passing day. I was just told about the uh, time limit and before I begin looking at this book, I want you to know this is the third book review that I've actually done of course, the one last year, the one this year, and over 20 years ago, I did a book review of The Late Great Planet Earth by Hal Lindsey. It's amazing what they all have in common. <laughs> a preacher went to a congregation for the tryout sermon. And as he was trying out on the first Sunday, he got up and preached 20 minutes and took his seat. The brethren were ecstatic. That Sunday night he preached again, preached 20 minutes, and he sat down. The brethren said, brother, you're hired. They like that. This went on year after year after year. Sunday morning, Sunday night. He would get up, he would preach 20 minutes, and he would take his seat. And year after year, the brethren were so thrilled with his preaching. One Sunday he got up, he started preaching. He preached 20 minutes. The brethren started gathering their books and their belongings, getting ready to depart. And the brother kept on preaching. He preached another 20 minutes. And still no sign of letting up. Another 20 minutes went by. And then he got into his second hour of preaching. And the brethren are just beside themselves. And finally, after two hours and 20 minutes of solid preaching, he took his seat. And the brethren surrounded him. What happened to you up there? He said, well, I'm not sure myself, brethren. He said, I'm, I'm going to try to figure out the problem. And they said, well, you better figure it out or you're fired. That's just all there is to that. Well, that Sunday afternoon when he came back to the building, the brethren met him. And they wanted to know, what's going to happen tonight? He said, don't worry, brethren, everything's fine. Everything's under control. Tonight I'm going to preach 20 minutes and we'll be done. They said, well, that's great, but what happened to you this morning? He said, oh, we figured that out after we got home. 
This morning I put my wife's teeth in by mistake. <laughs> Discovering Our Roots. This book is like all the others that have gone before. And as speaker after speaker has pointed out, they all have so many things in common. The one thing that they all seem to have in common is they are 98% error. You're going to find some truth in all of these books. And when you come to discovering our roots, the ancestry of the churches of Christ, hereafter I'm going to refer to this book simply by DOR, D-O-R, Discovering Our Roots. It's a result of the joint effort of C. Leonard Allen and Richard T. Hughes. And have you noticed how frequently the name Richard T. Hughes is found on this particular program? This work was printed in Abilene, Texas by Abilene Christian University Press. And it reminds you of that old saying that I started hearing back in the 60s and into the 70s, can any good thing come out of Abilene? C. Leonard Allen has held teaching positions at Abilene Christian University, Fuller Theological Seminary, and Biola University. Richard T. Hughes holds his MA from Abilene Christian, his BA in Bible and History from Harding University. He has taught in Pepperdine University, Abilene Christian, and has joined the faculty of Messiah College. This is a college of denominational and interdenominational influences. Also, the faculty is devoted to the views of the Anabaptists, the Pietists, and Wesleyan religions. And this will explain many of the things that you find as you start to pursue the pages of discovering our roots. One must admit that the statement on the back cover, it, meaning this book, it does what no other book does. Now, you talk about an introduction to a hundred different thoughts that come to one's mind. But it does, I must admit, contain some good information. And, and like I said, most of these books that are being reviewed, every speaker will tell you that there are some good things that they found, that they have discovered. But most of it is going to be contrary to God's word. As a matter of fact, as you discover good things, you discover so many things that are equally alarming. For example, let's just look at the contents page of Door. The chapter roots within and of themselves, the uh, chapter titles within and of themselves raise numerous red flags. Our roots in the Renaissance, our roots in the Reformation, our roots among English Puritans, our roots among New England Puritans, our roots among Baptists, our roots ad nauseum, and then finally, restoring life in the spirit, holiness and Pentecostal advocates, probably distant cousins to MacDever. Then you look to the page of contents and look at the title of the book again, Discovering Our Roots, The Ancestry of Churches of Christ. Do you see a discrepancy of terms? I don't see how you cannot see that discrepancy. Now correct me if I'm wrong, but it has never ever been my understanding that the Church of Christ, the Church of the New Testament, the Church that God promised would be built and would be an everlasting kingdom it has never been my conviction that it had its beginning or its roots with the Reformation movement or the Restoration movement or with the Puritans or with the Baptists or with Martin Luther or the Anabaptists or the Pentecostals or any other such thing. Last year, you will recall that when I started my review at that time, I turned to Daniel 2.44. Let's do that again. In the days of those kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, nor shall the sovereignty thereof be left to another people, but it shall break in pieces and consume 
and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. It's a very easy matter for any one of us to set up a timeline by which we can identify the church of the New Testament, God's kingdom, the churches of Christ that we read about in Romans 16, 16. My father, my grandfather, and my great-grandfather listened to gospel preachers as they would discuss the image that is revealed in the pages of Daniel chapter 2. The head of gold stood for the Babylonian Empire. The breast and arms of silver represented the Medo-Persian Empire. The belly and thighs, fashion of brass, indicated the coming of the Grecian Empire. The legs of iron, the feet of iron, mixed with clay and iron. This is the Roman Empire. What preacher in this very assembly has not preached that very outline and shown those different kingdoms coming up to the Roman Empire. And then Daniel prophesied that the kingdom of God, which is the church, would come in the days of those kings, Daniel 2.44. And sure enough, when you and I open up the pages of the New Testament and we begin to study, it is indeed Rome that rules the world. And we see this is that which hath been spoken through the prophet Joel. Acts chapter 2 verse 16. Peter is preaching that all of those prophecies, not only Daniel's prophecy, but all those prophecies of old pointing to the coming of the church of the Lord would have its beginning in that day and in that time. And again, every preacher in this assembly and literally hundreds and thousands of gospel preachers will tell you they have preached that very outline. In the book of Daniel, we learn that in the days of that fourth kingdom, the Roman Empire, the God of heaven was going to set up a kingdom which would never be destroyed. The dream is certain. The interpretation thereof, sure, Daniel 2, 44, 45. Now, if God tells us that he is going to do a thing, is God, the God of heaven, able to do what he promises that he will do? And again, what gospel preacher has not preached lesson after lesson after lesson on the fact that God is able that God will do what he says that he will do. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is an account that is well known to even boys and girls in the Lord's church. And how they were placed in that fiery, burn, uh, that fiery uh, furnace. These three youths were asked, if you could turn to Daniel 3.15, Who is that God that shall deliver you? They reply, if it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. He will deliver us out of thy hand, O king. Daniel 3, 17. And we all know how that account ends up. And then it's Daniel's turn. Daniel knows all about the decree and how he is not to pray to anyone except to worship the king himself, but yet Daniel continued to pray to God because it was his custom to pray to God. Daniel's arrested. He is placed into the den of lions. And early, early the next morning, the king rushes to the den, and here's what he cries out in Daniel 6.20, O Daniel, servant of the living God, is thy God whom thou servest continually able to deliver thee from the lions. Well, Daniel's very answer gives us the answer to that question. God is able to do what God promises that he will do. That's the message of the book of Daniel. You go through the book of Daniel and you see it over and over that God is able. Whatever the promise, God is able. Now, those who assert that Jesus Christ came to this earth in order to establish his kingdom, but somehow failed, the Jews rejected him, and so 
there was a decision made that they were just going to have to give up on that particular try and try again. At some future unknown point in time, Christ supposedly is going to come again, is going to set up his kingdom in the literal city of Jerusalem and reign for a literal 1,000 years. And we all know about that fairy story. But the people who advocate that nonsense known as premillennialism, they do not worship the God of Daniel. They do not know the God of the Bible. Because my God is able to do what he promises to do. And he will not fail. In Psalm 19 verse 7, the testimony of Jehovah is sure, making wise is simple. In Psalm 19, verse 8, the precepts of Jehovah are right, rejoicing the heart. Many of you will remember when the late lamented Brother Marshall Keeble would hold his Bible high in the air after having made a point, usually rebuking or exposing some false doctrine, and he would make the statement, the Bible is right. Psalm 33 and the verses 4. You know, you could take the Bible today. You could put the entire stack of books that were reviewed last year and that, have, that are being review, reviewed this year, stack them on one side of the table, and then you could hold up the Bible on the other side of the table and make the same statement. The Bible is right. It doesn't matter what these books may say. The Bible is right. And so as you turn to the preface pages, since the Bible is right, since God is able to deliver what he has promised that he will deliver, then C. Leonard Allen and Richard T. Hughes must of necessity be wrong. Allen and Hughes query, for example, quote, where was the true church in those long and desolate years between the apostles and the restoration, unquote. I was unaware that the eternal and everlasting kingdom of God was missing during that time. Is it possible that these professors do not have within their personal libraries an English dictionary that will define for them the meaning of the words eternal and everlasting? If the kingdom of God was missing or absent or gone at any one point during all of these ages, then God did not deliver what God promised that he would deliver to do. This is the eternal kingdom of God. It shall not be destroyed. Jesus Christ himself reminds us that the gates of Hades could not destroy this kingdom. It is an everlasting kingdom. It would be interesting if the authors of Dor could inform us as to what particular date in the time of history that the church of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was destroyed and completely came to an end. But I do not find that within this book. Hughes makes it clear, and you'll notice in the manuscript that I have a question mark after that word clear, that, quote, churches of Christ have roots that predate Thomas and Alexander Campbell by several centuries, unquote. When I was 11 years old and a new babe in Christ, I knew this truth. The church of my Lord predates Alexander Campbell and Thomas Campbell by centuries. But having pursued the pages of Dora three times, I'm, un I'm unable to learn from the pages of this book exactly how many centuries these authors believe are involved. Paul speaks to the elders of the Church of Christ in Ephesus. In Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. And this is 1,800 years. 18 centuries. 
before the time of the Campbells. Paul writes specifically of the churches of Christ in Romans 16 and verse 16. And again, we're talking about 1,800 years before the coming of the Campbells. And then Alan makes it clear, and I have another question mark in the manuscript after the word clear, quote, that churches of Christ stand in the lineage of New England Puritans, unquote. But by the author's own admission, English Puritanism had its beginning in the 1620s. Well, I have a question for you. How could the church of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in the first century find its lineage among the Puritans of the 17th century? Now, that's a pretty good question, even if I did think of it. Also, if you have the uh, book open to this page, notice it has 16th century. That should be 17th century. I had five proofreaders in Event, Texas, and I don't know how many proofreaders were involved in the process here. I proofread it three times myself. It took Brother Dub, an older, wiser preacher, to point out to me this is 17th century, not 16th century. So please make that correction. Look at the Renaissance and the Reformation, where Dore dares to ask, quote, where did we come from? We often have assumed that our roots are simply in the New Testament, unquote. Allen and Hughes must have missed out on those powerful lessons taken from Daniel and the other prophets of old. Dore speaks of our tradition multiplied dozens of times. And like previous speakers, at one time I started to count. But after a while, I grew weary of counting. And so I, I gave up. They refer to those, quote, who are heirs of Barton Stone, Alexander Campbell, and David Lipscomb, unquote. Now the Apostle Paul has a slightly different slant to all of this, does he not? When you and I turn to Romans 8, 16, the Spirit himself beareth witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, join heirs with Christ. Now as for me and my house, we will take the words of an inspired apostle by the name of Paul over the writing of Allen and Hughes anytime. The authors are professors. As professors, I am assuming that they know the meaning of the words that they choose. And I want you to notice that when it comes to the two different kinds of, of roots, they talk about sacred roots, and then they talk about profane roots. Well, let's see what Mr. Webster himself has to say on that word profane. Quote, to treat something sacred with abuse, irreverence, or contempt, to desecrate, unquote. And it is my conviction that the authors of this book achieved that goal. And they achieved it in every way imaginable. The second chapter of Door discusses the Dark Ages. Now there's some good material in this chapter. You will read about Erasmus of Rotterdam, Thomas Aquinas, John Wycliffe, John Huss. There's even a discussion of Christian humanism. But here's what I found noteworthy. Quote, that to trace the roots of churches of Christ, one must begin instead with the widespread renaissance, unquote. To trace the roots of churches of Christ? If you or I were writing a manuscript on tracing the roots of the churches of Christ, where would you begin? And, and how would you finish that sentence, to trace the roots of churches of Christ, one must begin isn't this where you would want to start? What, what other source other than God's holy writ could you possibly put in the blank, so to speak, that would be correct? Well, let me tell you one answer that is incorrect to begin instead with the widespread renaissance. I was blindsided then to learn that, quote, while churches of Christ have insisted over the years that they are not Protestants, but only Christians, their roots nonetheless reach back into Protestant Reformation, unquote. 
In the book, you'll notice that the word they and their has been emphasized. Are these men our brethren? They are talking about in context New Testament Christians. So are these men our brethren as they refer to New Testament Christians by the term they and their? But what else would you expect when you're dealing with profane roots rather than sacred? Five times on pages 22 and 23, the authors place scripture alone in quotation marks. Again, how marvelous it would be if all of the books that were being reviewed could continue in that vein, Scripture alone. And this is another one of those terms that I started counting, and I, I frankly lost count. But it would be marvelous if we could learn a few lessons in this particular chapter. Swingley was a serious student of the Scripture. And uh, he was upset with numerous errors within Catholicism. He was more cautious than Luther in the area of reform when it came to the corrupted church. He prepared 65 theses. Actually, this would be 65 propositions for debate. And uh, primarily, it all had to do with the uh, selling of indulgences that uh, really got his ire up. And Swingley served as chief pastor in Zurich. And as chief pastor... I want you to notice, he rejected the instruments of music and the baptism of infants. Swingley, of course, was killed October the 11th, 1531. And then Swingley saw to it that the, uh, and this is a quote again, page 27 of the book, that the cathedral was stripped bare of its statues, relics, pictures, organs were destroyed, priestly vestments abolished, and the walls whitewashed. The people must be educated in the word of God. And you know, when I started reading this uh, particular quote from the book at the first, I said, well, this is really commendable. This is really good stuff. Statues, relics, pictures, organs, all destroyed. Vestments were abolished. The people must be educated in the word of God. Now, ho now hang on right here. So that neither vestments nor songs have a place in the worship. Songs, Swingley said, did not have a place in the worship. He also rejected congregational music and excluded all audible music from the Christian assembly, unquote. Now, as one studies these new doctrines, uh, we, we can't help but be reminded of Acts chapter 17, verse 21, and those who had no other desire except to hear to, or to tell some new thing. But one wonders how Swingley and the Anabaptist Conrad Grebel could justify this particular new thing in light of the plain teaching of the New Testament, Ephesians 5.19, Colossians 3.16. Now there were those in the times of the Apostle Paul, and there were those in the time of the Reformation movement, and those in the time of the Restoration movement, who delighted in either telling or hearing some new thing. And guess what, folks? We're in the 21st century, and it's still going on. It's still taking place. The Bible specifies that we are to sing in our worship to God. Several scriptures are referenced there. You know all of them. We have a new anti-group that has emerged among the Lord's Church in the past 20 or so years, uh, give or take a few years. I refer to these brethren as the anti-songs of praise to Jesus group. I could not believe the first time I came across this doctrine that these brethren are actually advocating that if you should sing a song of praise to Jesus Christ and anywhere within that song you address him in first person, that song at that point automatically becomes a prayer to Jesus. Now don't laugh, because I'm serious. I know of congregations in Texas and in Oklahoma that have divided over this very issue. This is a damnable doctrine of the devil. 
and it needs to be met head on. Some brethren have confused the songs of praise to Jesus with a prayer to Jesus. In 2004, a preacher stepped into a pulpit in Beeville, Texas, and made this statement, and I quote, and I have the tape so you can hear it if you want to hear it with your own ears. Christians, quote, can sing songs of praise about Jesus Christ, but that we cannot sing songs of praise to Jesus Christ, unquote. Now, while we have no authority whatsoever to pray to Jesus Christ, I submit to you we do have authority to praise Jesus Christ, our Lord. Unto the praise of his glory, Ephesians 1 verse 12, again at Ephesians 1 and verse 14. In the midst of the congregation will I sing thy praise, Hebrews 2 verse 12. Now, it's hard to realize, but we actually have brethren today who are advocating that we cannot do the very thing that God in his word has commanded us to do. But it is going on right now. I have in my own possession three separate lists of these songs that have been compiled, some by elders, some by uh, preachers, and some a, a joint, the third one is a joint effort of preachers and, I'm sorry, elders and preacher. And there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of songs you take the hymn book right here and you would have to eliminate probably 150 to 200 songs using this particular criteria. I've actually challenged the Rodriguez clan to mount the polemic platform and to discuss these in a public uh, setting. And as of today's date, they still will not defend this error. The late and beloved Brother Guy in Woods has correctly observed, quote, Progress is good only when it is in the direction of Christ and not away from him and in some matters is far preferable to be non-progressive, particularly in not going beyond what the Lord has said. Brethren, we need to be reminded of that powerful truth. We need to go back to those great men who have gone on and realize how important that truth was, and, and so much of it is coming to pass today. Speaking of the songs, speaking of uh, trying to forbid the songs from being sung in music, I had the privilege many, many years ago of hearing uh, the late brother Guy N. Woods. Uh, he was doing one of his famous question and answer sessions. It was in Marlow, Oklahoma. And he was just answering one question after another. And one question was put to him that had to do with the uh, song service and uh, also the instrument of music and so forth. And, he, and uh, Brother Woods was asked this question. What would be the difference between a song leader with his pitch pipe and the piano or the organ? And I was wondering, what will he say to that? And I'll never forget his answer. It's turned out to be quite a classic. He said the difference between the piano or the organ and that pitch pipe that is used by a song leader is that the pitch pipe has the common sense to know when to shut up. I've used that so many times. But brethren need to dismount their hobby horses. They need to preach that old time Jerusalem gospel message once more. How many of you brethren have gone to hold a gospel meeting or have gone to speak on a lectureship with uh, other preachers and after your lesson, some of those older brethren would come up to you and say, brother, I haven't heard preaching like that in years. Brethren, why not? If you and I are preaching the old time Jerusalem gospel message and our brothers and sisters in Christ are coming up to us at a gospel meeting or a lectureship and saying, brother, I haven't heard preaching like that in years. We need to be asking some elders and some preachers. Why not? 
What is amiss? Allen and Hughes Roots Among the Puritans. The authors of Door begin this section by saying, quote, Our Reformation era roots does not end with the Swiss Reformed tradition. Unquote. Now, over and over, these men will speak of our movement, our roots, our claim. If they had used the term God's movement or God's roots or God's claim, I would have counted those. It couldn't have been more than two or three in the entire book. But it's always our movement, our roots, our claim. Next, they observe that Tyndale believed that Scripture alone should determine all Christian beliefs, practices, and institutions, unquote. And with that belief, we all fully concur and would be in complete agreement. And then Dorrit dares to ask this question. Now listen carefully, quote, What bearing does the English Puritan movement have upon the origins of churches of Christ? Unquote. And I went back to that statement three or four or five different times to check the spelling because in the manuscript you'll notice that origins is plural. Again, if you and I were writing the question, <laughs> the question would be origin singular, would it not? But they themselves asked, what bearing does the English Puritan movement have upon the origins, plural, of the churches of Christ? And the authors do not seem to actually have the, uh, the courage to just come out and give a forthright answer, a truthful answer to that question. So would you allow me to give an answer to that question for them? What bearing does the English Puritan movement have upon the origin, singular, of the churches of Christ? Nothing at all. Absolutely nothing. When you turn to the book, I want you to remember already, Paul penned to the intent that now unto the principalities and the powers in the heavenly places might be made known through the church the manifold wisdom of God according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Ephesians 3, 10, and 11. I am a Christian today because Jesus Christ is alive. Unlike every man-made denomination on the face of the earth, we serve a living Lord, a resurrected Redeemer, and that one who is the sinner's Savior. Name any denomination in the phone directory, and their founder is dead. In almost every congregation with whom I have ever labored, at one time or another, I would take the local phone directory to the pulpit and read every man-made denomination in town, name the founder of that denomination, and point out the time of that man's birth and death. And I challenge Brother David to do that with the Houston phone book someday. <laughs> it won't be a 20-minute sermon. Like every other speaker, I have to say there's more information in the book. Make sure that you have the book and that you study this material. I hope you will especially read those uh, two paragraphs on page 200 uh, that I have written. And in contrast, I want to do this, and the lesson is yours. It's one of the most difficult things that I have done as a preacher of the gospel. In the past 10 years, I lost my mother and my father to death. This has caused me to think more about heaven and judgment, things to come. I want to speak very briefly to Curtis Cates, B.J. Clark, Stan Crowley, Mac Deaver, Garland Elkins, Barry Grider, Brad Harrod, Tommy Hicks, Bobby Liddell, Dave Miller, Ken Ratcliffe, Paul Sane, Robert R. Taylor, Jr., and Tyler Young. In the past 10 plus years, I have, I have participated in many lectureships with you men. I've learned so much valuable truth from you men. And this is not an exhaustive list. One thing 
that I learned in a very powerful way from the men that I've just listed is that the Christian cannot fellowship those who are not in fellowship with God. Thus, in the past six years, I and the men on this lectureship have not participated with you men in these lectures, and it breaks my heart, and it breaks the heart of every speaker on this lectureship. You brethren know the truth. You brethren have preached the truth. There was a time when you would proclaim and practice that truth. Brethren, this cannot please God. When C. Leonard Allen and Richard T. Hughes look to us today and they see this obvious division, Don't you know they glory? Don't you know Satan glories? Brethren, you once stood so solidly in God's precious and powerful truth. Why don't you come back? Not to us, but to God and to God's word. Abram said unto Lot, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, and between my herdsmen and thy herdsmen, for we be brethren. I thank you for the kindness of your time and your attention. Thank you, Brother Jesse, for a fine lesson. Certainly, uh, you can see right now that book caused him to discover his roots. He pulled all of his hair out and looked at it, I guess. But I don't know. All these books are frustrating to me and to all of us, I, I know. And I would say to that same list of men that you just made reference to that uh, we stand still today right where you claim to have stood those so many years ago. And certainly would uh, welcome you back and with open arms should you repent and return to your first love. We'll be dismissed now, and we will have the uh, beginning, begin, uh, beginning ready for the open forum. So um, please return back at the bottom of the hour. Thank you.